Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today's the end of my second week teaching on the Christian First Aid Kit, and this is a condensed version of the Christian Survival Kit that I taught nearly 30 years ago. Uh, the original Christian Survival Kit had 16 teachings in it. This one just has six. So it's, it doesn't cover as many subjects, but it's new and it's updated, and these are really, really powerful truths that we've been talking about. Jesus was teaching his disciples what to do uh, in between the crucifixion and the resurrection to be able to endure the discouragement, the fear, the confusion, and all of these things that would come against them. Likewise, we can take these same things that Jesus told his disciples, and we can apply them in our crisis. And so this is the way that I've been using this, is to say that when you come into a crisis situation, we need to follow what Jesus told his disciples in the sequence that he told his disciples. And in John 14, 1, the very first thing he said was, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So the very first thing that I taught last week was grab hold of your emotions. Don't panic. Apply faith instead of fear. Don't allow these negative emotions to operate. All of this week, we've been focused on John 14, 2 and 3, where he talked about going to heaven and preparing a place for them and that he would come back and receive them. You know, in those statements, it made it clear that it wasn't the end when Jesus was crucified and his body was buried, that wasn't the end. He made it very clear that he would return and receive them unto himself. If they would have taken these words, and if, you know, he had prophesied 14 different times that he would be resurrected from the dead, even if they had forgotten that, if they had just listened to his instructions the night before his crucifixion, he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Even if they had forgotten all of the rest of the three and a half years of ministry, and if they had just remembered this last thing he said unto them, it would have given them reason to hope. They wouldn't have been totally hopeless. They would have said, well, he just told us he's coming back. But see, most people, the physical world, physical reality just trumps everything else. To most people... What they see, taste, hear, smell, and feel just dominates them. They just can't believe anything beyond that. And this is the exact reason that Jesus started talking about in my father's house. He was trying to get them out of just going by what they saw and what they felt. He was trying to get them into faith to let them realize that there is more than just this physical world. In his father's house, talking about heaven, there were many mansions. You're going to live forever in a mansion. I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself. He was trying to get them into faith. And I turned over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, and said this is exactly what Paul did. Paul said it's just a light affliction, and he gave two reasons, because it's just for a moment. And also, we aren't looking at things. We aren't looking only at things that can be seen, but we're also looking at things that can't be seen. And then we went on down into 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where he started talking about our confidence and assurance that we have a glorified body waiting for us. There isn't any physical proof of that. It's something that we just choose to believe based on the revelation of God's Word. It's what's called faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but the, to boil it down to its simplest terms, the reason that we fall apart like a $2 suitcase when problems come our way is because we aren't believing God. We aren't trusting God. If you were walking by faith, which faith is many different things, there's many ways of describing it, but faith is, is seeing things that can't be seen. Faith is is going by things that are real. They just aren't necessarily real in this physical world. You know, the Bible says, by his stripes we were healed. It puts it into the past tense. Most Christians see that as something that we confess. In other words, we aren't healed. We really aren't healed. Reality is that we are sick. We're dying. But I'm going to say that by his stripes we were healed. And if I'll say it often enough and long enough, then I'll make it become real. That's wrong. And that's the reason so many people stumble and fall at faith. 
Faith isn't just faking it until you make it. It isn't just saying something is real when it really isn't real. And if you can just mix it with faith, then it'll become real. No, faith is seeing something that does exist. It is real. It's just not a physical, tangible reality. There is a spiritual world. There are spiritual truths. There is a spiritual you on the inside. And if you've been born again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ. As a matter of fact, that's in the exact same context, just a couple of verses from where I've been reading. And it's a logical progression of exactly what he was saying about we walk by faith and not by sight. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. That's not talking about your physical body. When you get born again, you don't get a new body. Now, you've got a promise of a glorified body in the future. We will have a spiritual body that you exist in throughout all eternity, but it's not a reality right now. It's not your physical body that got saved. You know, I hold meetings all the time. People get born again in my meetings, and I tell them after you're born again, I say, now you're a new creature, but it's not your body. If you were a woman before you got born again, you're still going to be a woman. If you were a man, you're still going to be a man. If you were fat, you're still going to be fat. <laughs> Man, your physical body is not the part of you that changes. And it's not your soulish realm, this mental, emotional part of you. If you were, you know, if you had bad experiences and bad memories and things that bothered you, your mind and your emotions don't instantly change. They can change over a period of time as you renew your mind, but you don't just instantly lose all of your past and your history and your thinking. If you were stupid before you got saved, you're still going to be stupid after you get saved unless you renew your mind and start drawing on the power of God and changing something. Your body and your soul are not the part that's saved. It's not the part that old things have passed away, all things have become new. But there is a spiritual you on the inside. And in that spirit, you have been healed. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, that God's opening up your eyes and wants you to see the hope of his calling and the greatness of his power towards you who have believed according to, that means in proportion to, or to the degree of the power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. In that spirit part of you that got born again, you have raising from the dead power on the inside. And in that spirit, you have been healed. So when a person is saying, I believe in the name of Jesus, I'm healed, and yet it doesn't look that way in your physical body, some people think, well, see, you're just saying that it's so when it's not so, hoping it will become so. Nope, that's not it. What I'm doing is saying what is real. It's just real in the spiritual world. And if I really believe it, then my faith becomes a bridge so that what is true in the spiritual world passes over and affects this physical world, and it changes us, and it becomes a reality. Man, that's awesome. I don't know if you got that. That took me decades to figure out what I just said, but that is a profound truth. And this is what Paul is talking about. This is why Jesus talked about heaven and doing these things. He was trying to get them to realize that there's more than what you can see and feel. You know, it really disappoints me when I pray for a person. And I mean, I perceive the power of God flowing into this person. I tell them, you're healed in Jesus' name. And they say, well, I hope so. I'm going to go to the doctor and I'm going to get it confirmed. I'm not against doctors, and I'm not against you going to doctors, but I'm saying that, see, this person doesn't really believe that anything has happened until you can somehow or another prove it in a test tube, until a doctor can test you and somehow or another verify that it's been done. Now, I'm not saying that we just go through life with everything getting worse and ignore the physical realm and just bury your head in the sand and say, no, I've got it in the spirit. Well, it needs to come out of the spirit and into your physical body. So there's a balance between what I'm saying. But I am saying that there are people who don't believe that anything has happened until the pain stops, until their bank account is full, until they can see or feel all of these results. And I'm telling you that that kind of person is just not going to very often experience the power of God. You've got to believe that you've already got it. 
that God placed this power on the inside of you. And then when you go to saying, I'm healed, you aren't saying it trying to get healed, trying to make God do something. You're saying it because you believe what has already taken place, the power that he's already put on the inside of you. And you're realizing that your faith and your words are just a tool. It's like a bridge, a vehicle for God to transfer these things from what is true in the spiritual realm to being true in the physical realm. Man, that's powerful. And many people are just missing out on this because they are so carnally minded. They can't see into the spiritual realm. They can't perceive anything. They don't believe that anything exists other than what they feel or what the doctor or the lawyer or the banker tells them. They're just limited to this physical world. And this is the reason that Jesus tried to get their attention away from just the crucifixion and let them know that he, it wasn't over when he died. It wasn't the end. He was going to prepare a place for them. There was things happening in the spiritual world and that he would come back, back again. They couldn't see any of those things with just their physical eyes. But by faith, they could walk by faith and they could have perceived this and they could have operated in victory during this tough time instead of being fearful and huddled in fear running from the authorities. They could have been bold. You know, Peter denied the Lord three times because he was fearful of being caught. During that exact same period of time, John, another one of the apostles, went with Jesus into the high priest home. And he was standing there and identifying himself with Jesus. And you know what? He didn't get hurt. He didn't get crucified. He didn't get taken. A lot of the fear that motivated Peter to deny the Lord was unfounded fear. They were after Jesus. They weren't after his followers. And I believe that eventually, you know, if they had been successful with Jesus, if he hadn't arose, risen from the dead, that they would have come out the, after the others. But I'm saying that Peter, it was not really realistic what he was doing. He was just operating in fear because he was only looking at things in the natural realm. Now, it says that all of the disciples forsook Jesus and fled, and so that implies that John was one of them. But at least for a period of time, or to some degree, John stood and was bold and believed God and went with Jesus into the high priest house and was made known that he was a disciple of Jesus. Peter could have done that. All the rest of them could have done that. We have the power to remain faithful. You, you do not have to fail in every situation. And this is what Jesus is saying. The very first thing that he told them is, don't let your heart be troubled. Get into faith. Believe me. Put things into perspective. Go beyond what you can see. Think about heaven. Think about the unseen. Walk by faith and not by sight. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, if you could just take these few little things that I've said the last two weeks. I've only covered three verses in two weeks out of John 14. And yet, if you could implement those things, this would radically radically change your life. And let me just state the obvious that this is counter culture, not only to our, our secular culture, but this is counter to our religious culture. Most Christians are not walking by faith. Most churches are not preaching faith this way. Most people, when you come into a problem, they'll just get down and walla in self-pity and hurt and pain and cry with you. And there is a place to weep with them that weep. But at the same time, we've got to be like Jesus, that here, is, here were his disciples entering into this terrible time, and instead of saying, guys, don't feel bad. You're going to get depressed. You're going to run. You're all going to forsake me and flee. But you know what? It's just for a brief period of time. You're just human. This is all you can do. Instead of him somehow or another reinforcing this failure in telling them they had to go through this, he told them, no, don't let your heart be troubled. He told them things that were completely opposite. And I tell you, there's not enough people today telling people that you can rise above your situation. You do not have to let circumstances dominate you. Just because somebody does something bad to you, you do not have to respond in hatred and hurt. You can choose to love them. Jesus chose to love the very people crucifying him. You can choose to love people that have done you wrong. 
And sad to say, a lot of Christians don't believe this. They aren't preaching the same message that Jesus preached. I remember being at a church in Ohio, and this is 20-something years ago, and I was teaching on these exact passages of Scripture, and I was saying these exact things that you do not have to just hate because somebody did something to you. And I had a young woman come up to me. She was about 21 years old, somewhere around there. And she had been sexually abused by her grandfather every day or every other day of her life since she was four or five years old until she was 14 years old. The grandfather lived in the house with, with uh, I forgot if it was his daughter or son, but anyway, with the family and then his granddaughter. And he abused this girl secretly for 10 years. And then this girl got born again at the age of 14. And when she got born again, I mean, she got gloriously saved. She was so excited. And she was just free. And uh, somehow she brought this out and told what her grandfather had been doing to her. And so the child of, this, of the man who had been doing this, they got mad. And I don't know if they prosecuted him, but they certainly kicked him out of the house. They would have nothing to do with him. They cut him off terrible rejection and hatred towards him for what he had done. And the girl, they wanted her to go to uh, psychology and all of this testing. I think they may have done some of that. But anyway, she wouldn't cooperate because the psychologists were telling her that, oh, you're scarred and, oh, you've got to, uh, you've got to let this out. You've got to vent and all of your hatred and your hurt and your frustration. And this girl was telling them, says, I don't have any hatred for him. Jesus saved me. Jesus forgave me. If he forgave me for what I've done, I forgive my grandfather. And she was operating in total love. She was able to put it behind her. She wasn't going through with this seething bitterness and hatred on the inside. And yet even her parents, the Christian leaders of the church, other people were telling her that you're just in denial. You aren't facing it. You're going to be destroyed by this. And it finally got so bad that this girl around the age of 16 or 17, her parents kicked her out of the house because she wasn't dealing with it. She wasn't facing reality. She was living in this uh, uh, imaginary world or fantasy world is what they called it, of not being angry at her grandfather for what he had done. And she had actually been rejected and persecuted because she wasn't hurt and because she wasn't devastated. She let Jesus heal her hurts and she was living above it. And she heard me preaching this exact message that I've been sharing over television. And she came up with tears in her eyes and says, thank you for saying that Jesus, that the provision he's made is greater than whatever problems. And then she gave me her story and she says, honestly, she says, I don't have any bitterness. I don't have any hurt. God forgave him. He forgave me. I'm forgiven. I'm a new creature. She says, I'm over it. I'm not being destroyed by this. And yet her own family, her church, everybody had persecuted her because she wasn't being natural like everybody else. There are some of you watching this program that you have, and I'm saying this in love, don't turn me off, but you have used your abuse that happened to you, your failures, the way that people have treated you as an excuse for you just having problems the rest of your life. There are some of you that are 10, 20, 30, 40 years removed from the thing that you say that destroyed you. And even if it was true that something like that happens and you can't choose to become better instead of bitter, well, here you are decades removed and you're still letting what happened decades ago control you today. That is illogical. Even in the natural, if you accepted defeat after a period of time, you ought to be able to climb out of that and go on with your life. But you have nurtured this and you've actually amplified your problem. And you have just accepted the fact that you're only human and that you can't overcome this. Everything I've been teaching for two weeks is counter to this. The instructions of Jesus to his disciples is, no, guys, you don't have to fall apart. You don't have to just enter into total defeat. You could actually be operating in faith during this period of time. Until you see how it all works out, if you just trust me, if you would take my words, you could operate in victory through this thing. And likewise, there are people watching this program that you have used something that's happened to you in your past. And I'm not saying it wasn't bad. But you have let, you've been a victim 
of other people. See, as long as you think that you can't control your emotions, you can't choose to operate in faith instead of defeat, as long as you believe that, then you are the victim. We live in a fallen world. People will treat you badly. You will have bad things happen. And if it's other people that force you to be the person that you are, then there's not a one of us that has a chance of making it through this life intact. Because there's, there's more than enough evil people out there that the devil can inspire to hurt you and to do things into your life. But if what I'm saying is true, if what Jesus said is true, that we can choose to let not our heart be troubled. We can walk in faith. We can walk by faith and not by sight. And if these things are true, then you know what? That makes me the victor. As long as other people are what makes me do the things that I do, then you are a victim. As long as you don't accept responsibility and say, I can do better than this. I don't care what anybody has done to me. I have a choice whether I'm going to come out of this thing ahead or not. Until you adopt that mindset, then you are a victim. It's a victim mentality. And here's a clue. Here's, here's a warning to you that you may not hear everybody say, but you aren't going to change your circumstance. You aren't going to change all of the prejudice that's in the world. You aren't going to get rid of every person so that nobody will ever rub you the wrong way. You cannot live this life so that there will never be a hurt or a pain or something bad happen in your life. It's just not going to happen. We're in a fallen world with fallen people. If, as long as you think that you've got to change all of these things before you can be happy, that's the reason that you can't stay with the mate that you're with. And so you divorce them and go get another one trying to fix this, and, it, and you wind up with the same problems. And you divorce them, and you're on your third, fourth, fifth marriage, and you find out that the common denominator in every marriage is you. It's not them. You're trying to just get rid and find the perfect mate. If you find the perfect mate, don't marry him because then you would make it an imperfect marriage. Amen. That's what people say about church. If you're looking for the perfect church, don't join it because it becomes imperfect the moment that you join it. You just can't solve all of your problems by changing circumstances and everybody out there. The only way that you're going to successfully win in life is to accept responsibility and say, I am not going to be troubled. I am going to operate in faith. I'm going to walk by faith, not by sight. I don't care what happens to me. I don't care what people do to me. That is immaterial. He that's in me is greater than he that's in the world, and I can overcome anything. I don't care what the opposition is. That is the only way that you are really going to start experiencing victory is to accept responsibility. Quit being a victim and start being a victor. The very first step towards that is to accept responsibility that it is not what you do that makes me mad. It's my failure to process it and to walk in faith, and I'm letting my feelings dominate me that destroys me, not what you did. Nobody can destroy me without my consent and cooperation, and I'm just not giving it to you. I'm not giving it to the devil. Praise the Lord. Man, those are some powerful things. Today's our last day to offer you the second teaching in this six-part set that I've entitled The Christian First Aid Kit. And uh, we will continue to offer the entire album, but we offer each teaching in the album individually as a gift, one at a time. And today's our last day to make the second teaching in this six-part set available as a gift. So listen as our announcer gives you that information. Today's complete teaching titled Christian First Aid Kit was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. This series has over six hours of teaching and is available on either audio CD or DVD. Each is available for 19 pounds. This teaching is also available on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. You can receive it for 19 pounds when you contact us. Or you can get the Christian First Aid Kit as part of the Survival Kit package. In addition to Christian First Aid Kit, this package also includes the Christian Survival Kit, a 16-part series. Together, these two series provide 22 hours of teaching. The entire package has a catalog value of 55 pounds, but today you can get the Survival Kit package for just 50 pounds when you order. The second audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this second CD titled 
Christian First Aid Kit Part 2 free of charge. We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled Effortless Change for £8.50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. This guy called Andrew Womack began talking one day and I was so impressed with his clarity the way he would look at the Word of God as it really is and also how he would make that relevant to us and that's what I'm always after when I listen to any ministry to what extent it's faithful to the Word but I realize that I'm often not faithful to the Word I make assumptions about things and I found a man in Andrew Womack who never makes assumptions he looks at what it says he records that's the voice of God and he tells us what God is saying the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And if what we're preaching and giving people faith for is come to Jesus so your sins will be forgiven and you won't go to hell, well, then that's what they've got faith for. That's where they're living, and they have done it so that they can avoid hell. But they don't have as a goal intimate, close, personal relationship with Jesus. He said on this particular tape, he said, look at John 3:16." As you've never looked at it before it's the first time you've ever seen it and he read it to us and he said for years the church has tended to emphasize that the purpose of God sending his son was that we should not perish and though that's wonderfully true and I shall not go to hell because of what Jesus did the point he said is everlasting life the purpose of our salvation is we should have everlasting life I found there are 60 references in John's gospel alone to life and the law of the spirit of life in Christ makes me free at last from the law of sin and death and I'm so grateful to dear Andrew Womack for pointing that out. I'd never, I'd read it, of course I had, thousands of times, I'd never seen it. But he was used of God to show me what God is really saying instead of what I thought he was saying, which is wonderful, just wonderful.